slam. Hello. Good morning, NPN. Aloha. Yeah, it's nice when you extend the ha because it extends your exhale. Aloha. It's not the proper pronunciation, but as a dance person, I always appreciate a longer exhale. So thank you for coming to Art Slam this morning. My name is Christopher Morgan. I'm the Executive Artistic Director of Dance Place in Washington, DC. I'm also an artist and I've been the recipient in the past of a creation fund and it was such a catalytic moment for me as an artist and part of that was sharing work in a format much like this. It's very important for us to get to see our artists and share in what they're working on and this is the beginning of that. So thank you for joining us at 9 a.m. because I saw a lot of you at 2 a.m. <laughs> upstairs. Mm -hmm. Um, so, it's our pleasure to get started this morning. I have not seen all of these artists yet, so I hope they're all here as we start to introduce them. Um, a reminder for the artists, there are two mics up here that you can use. The clicker is here if you need it for your visual support, and the tech people are right back there. Make eye contact with them if you need help. We're going to get things started. Coming to us first is Aisha Tandiwe Bell. Come on up. Did I say your second name correctly? Correct me. <laughs> Excited to learn. Thank you. Um, hello, good morning. Um, I have to dash out of here after I talk, so unfortunately I won't see everyone else because I have to catch a flight back to New York because other stuff is happening. <laughs> um, but my name is Aisha Tandiwe Bell. Yes, the middle name is Kosa, so there's a click in it. I can't pronounce it. Um, but I will start and show you some of my work. Now, this will make it go? Okay. So this is my last big public project um, in Newark, New Jersey. My work kind of um, deals with the idea of, um, well, multiple consciousness and also the two-dimensional um, kind of way women, people of color, people in class are seen. Um, and so the, my, the basis of my idea, kind of science fiction really, is that the conscious push through that two-dimensional space of assumption into the third and this invade the space of the viewer. So this public piece, it's uh, about eight feet tall, 14 feet wide, and uh, it's called Together We Are One, and it was made for uh, a space in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and that's my most recent large project. Um, I just finished a residency at LMCC, and um, kind of as a metaphor for the idea of my pieces pushing into the third dimension, but they're also trapped, right? They don't come out of the wall. And so I started making these conceptual traps um, that spoke about displacement, that spoke about um, con consuming, um, they kind of are covered and made beautiful. And so I did, I turned my studio at that space into a trap by covering the walls with fabric. And then I built several traps, my traps out of these cardboard boxes and sticks that I found in lower Manhattan and uh, decorated them and people came and visit. And it was interesting because people like laid down, it became a chill space, they really liked them, the children loved it. So. Um, it's new work, newer work for me, so I'm, it's in process for me. But I have like, you know, eight of these right now, <laughs> and they're big. <laughs> so I have to figure out what I'm doing next. Um, and um, so this is a still from a performance using those same traps. Um, and I made a trap song to go with the trap music, and so I danced and told a story um, with my trap houses. And this, this piece actually went to the Venice Biennale last year, which was very nice. Um, and this is, uh, a, this, this is also, this is a combination of taking the idea of the traps and mixing it with the, the mask, which is what I've always made, um, ceramic mask. Um, so that's the front, and this is the installation at um, a, a space, space one, 111 right here, and Peter is here. 
Hi, Peter. <laughs> um, in um, New Orleans, where are we? Alabama, thank you. <laughs> Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> all right, and this is, um, and this exhibition responded to all of the, um, uh, the protests happening across the country at that time. Um, and this image, while taking the people coming out of the wall and mixing the ideas behind the traps, also referenced people who shut down the highways at that time. Um, and this is also really new in process work, um, dealing with the idea of mask, invisibility, camouflage, fingerprinting, very concerned with the, um, the, the fingerprinting of people, but also of the scarification process. So it, it's, it's also pretty new for me and I'm working on it, but excited about it. So it combines masks that I make in clay with canvases that I paint. Um, and this is a flag, my first flag that I made in response to um, the first 50, the last 50 people who had been shot by the police. So I made a flag um, all in blues and greens. This is my second flag and they have been deconstructed um, and put back together. And this was the, when the scar scarification target pieces started to show up in my work. And that is also, that's 2000. 16, and this is uh, coming out of the wall, and I am blanking on the name, but I, I, the head shells, both shells, both held multiple consciousness, and this is recent. That's all from the residency. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Aisha Bell, superblackwoman at gmail.com. Superblackwoman at gmail.com. Make sure you get the program because all of the artist's contact information is in there, and especially because Aisha, Aisha is about to fly away from us, you can reach her. All right, so if you're following the program, we're back to the beginning of the program. Next up, another one. Ah, there she is. I hadn't seen you this morning since last night's open mic. It's good to see you here. Ladies and gentlemen of NPN, they's and them's as well, please welcome Liz James. Good morning, MPN. I want to first say thank you, thank you, thank you. I've had an amazing time. I am so glad to be in the room. I am so glad that you've invited me to be a part of this. So thank you, and thank you again. So let's just get to it. I am a playwright. My name is Elizabeth James, Liz James. Um, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I am a playwright, an actress, and a preschool teacher. Um, and I love saying that because I enjoy working with children as well as writing and doing the arts. So I love both equally. Um, I'm gonna talk to you today about two particular pieces that I'm working on. Um, the first one is Uncommon Ties, which was my first production last year with TTO, um, my art residency. And this um, particular piece talks about the Latimer family um, when um, mom decided to, if I can get it to work, sorry. Uh, mom decided to come out as gay and she ended up getting divorced from her husband, Jerome, of 15 years. And then she had to tell her family, particularly their teenage daughter, unique and good God. Um, it just went to pieces from there. So, um, and this is a shot of when your mom shows up at your partner's home on a Sunday morning to let her know she knows who you are and what you've done to her daughter and she don't like it one bit. Um, and as you can see, it wasn't going down so easy. They were ready to throw blows. Um, and there was a, I guess it's not working, I apologize. Um, there was a piece in here, a, a piece where she's actually explaining to her daughter that not necessarily that she's gay, but that she shouldn't discriminate against, you know, um, gay and queer folk because they're all people. And this conversation, unfortunately, you can't hear it, but it's a very interesting conversation when you have a 14-year-old who's asking her mom, 
well, mommy, who is this woman, and is she gay? And if she's gay, are you gay? And trying to explain that to a 14-year-old who already thinks they know everything. So for any parent in the room who has children who know everything, and truth of the matter is they know nothing, um, or very little at least, it's, it's a very difficult conversation. It's very hard. It's, um, it's just, it, it was just an unyielding situation with this family. And then the second piece I'm working on is called Welcome to Mima's. And this story is about two sisters who do not get along. And they decide to open a bakery. <laughs> right, exactly. You open a bakery with somebody you don't get along with. And at 4.30 in the morning, the sister who doesn't get along with you shows up, and she's demanding answers. And she's telling you things that you're not ready to hear, and you don't even want her in the place. And a food fight breaks out at 4.30 in the morning when you've got to open the business and feed your customers. It is a racy piece, but it's a fun piece. And it gets the conversation started when families, um, I don't know about your family, but my family's really good at ignoring the elephant in the room. So this piece really addressed that. Like, you're not going to ignore me anymore. I'm here and we're going to deal with this. So um, this is a piece I'm working on now and it should be out fall of next year. And thank you so much. And if you missed her on stage last night at the open mic, you really missed out. Thank you, Liz. Again, her email and her phone number, contact information are on the program. Make sure you have it. Crew in the back, can I ask, if I had this in my hand, should I be pointing it there or should I be pointing it there? It doesn't matter. Okay. So just this is the device. If you're coming up here, get familiar with it. All right. Next up, from Pittsburgh, Gia T. Casalano. Hi, thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm Gia Castellano. I'm originally from New York City. I've been living in Pittsburgh now for a number of years as an educator and an artist. And um, my performance work is rooted in instant composition, instant choreography. Uh, and I make that live in front of a public in which hopefully to magnify real time and as well to um, kind of remove the boundary between public and performer. Uh, my work is often done in solo as well, collaboration, multidisciplinary, site-specific. Um, platforms within a community engagement um, interaction. Uh, so I guess I'll start. Thank you. Okay, this is um, from an outdoor performance uh, community engagement where public would be directed by me through different um, triggers and gestures to follow me. Sometimes there was game playing, there was pause, flow, and um, lots of different things. And this is clearly a paused moment where the public had stopped alongside me. Whoops. <laughs> Uh-oh. I don't know. Hmm, doesn't seem to be. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm an adjunct resident artist there. Um, and this is a space uh, that I actually I created these vignettes specifically for this conference to show um, a little bit more stripped down approach to how I react to different spaces. And uh, this was a very spark, um, sparse space, rather. And so I only had music in which to respond to. This is actually um, at a proscenium stage. Generally, I like to work very close with public and through public. I respond um, from the public and the things they may do as well, the space. So it's very experiential and 
um, trigger oriented. Uh, this I was responding, well, there it goes. Uh, the next is a character that I'm building. This is called Red Shake Wig. This was actually done in my living room where I often will remove things because um, I can perform very often in very small venues such as gallery openings and so forth. So I practice here and uh, all I was dealing with basically was a clock, a time, and I was in duet with that. And this is just showing um, how some of the character building can evolve. And uh, oftentimes when I'm presenting, I will augment certain things that I take in film with um, time as well, filters, and I will use that as a projection to um, also show counterpoint and just use it as another vehicle to ins installation. Uh, this is um, actually here in Pittsburgh at 937 Liberty Avenue, where I'll be um, collaborating with a visual artist from CMU. We'll be making live instant compositions and live visual art in a platform where I'll be leading um, a guided meditation and somatic exploration um, with the public. So they'll be, um, they'll be making their own art as well through these uh, pieces of paper that we're going to spread out. They'll be lying on through the guided meditation and um, visual applications using charcoal. Uh, as well, the artists I'll be collaborating with will be making live art on the walls while I'm also instant closing in response. And I would say these are all examples of very stripped down approaches to the work. Generally, um, there would be public around, but I made all of these specific for this conference to just show processes in um, character building narratives. Thank you. <laughs> this last one is, is just a still. That was a still from um, a international improvisation uh, festival in the UK. Thank you. It's so great to have Pittsburgh represented here as well as your New York heritage. Thank you for being with us. Presenters, you can't miss Stanlin. She's always gorgeous and she's got those stripes on. She's right there helping you keep time. Next up is someone that probably barely needs an introduction in this room, the incredible Sean Dorsey. Come on up, Sean. Good morning. I love being transgender. I love being transgender. Can you imagine? I love choreographing dances from the powerful, graceful, informed location of my transgender body. I love my trans political consciousness and artistic aesthetic and dogged determination to stay alive and thrive in a world that would rather I did not stay alive or thrive. I love being transgender. Can you imagine that? Because I sure couldn't growing up. As a kid, I loved dance with every fiber in my tiny little queer body. At home, I danced around in my leotard to my fame and Rock 81 vinyl albums. But I didn't grow up going to dance class, and I never imagined that I could dance professionally because I never saw a single person like me in dance. I never saw a single 
trans person like me in dance. So how on earth could I imagine a life there? Imagination is no inconsequential thing, and that is why I'm an artist. Because I know that imagination keeps us alive. It literally keeps us alive. Do you know that 40% of trans adults have tried to kill themselves at least once? Driven by bullying, violence, white supremacy and racism, discrimination and a lack of seeing ourselves reflected and represented anywhere positively. Imagination is literally the difference between life and death. This is why I'm an artist. And that's the reality that my work is in conversation with. And so can we skip the first slide? You can skip the video. So I'm gonna talk about my new work. Um, Sean Dorsey Dance has now launched a three-year, 20-city tour of our new work, Boys in Trouble. Next slide. Boys in Trouble will tour through 2021 with support from the NEA, NDP, NPN, and I'm looking for presenters who wanna bring this work to your community. Next slide. Boys in Trouble is a timely, urgent, full-bodied commentary and investigation into contemporary American masculinity that places a trans and queer lens onto intersectional questions of, next slide, embodiment, violence, real talk about whiteness, black queer love and joy, shame and posturing. Next slide, please. Boys in Trouble travels with a long list of community engagement activities, if you know how I roll, that are designed to work in partnership with local trans and LGBTQ communities and agencies to reach and engage super diverse trans and queer and mixed communities. Next slide. Our APAP showcase of Boys in Trouble is gonna be at New York Live Art, so come and talk to me or grab a postcard in the lobby. Next slide. And next slide. Next slide and then go forward too if you could. So my new work is about imagination. This new work will premiere in 2021 and I'm looking for NDP and NPN commissioners and presenters, funders and residency partners for this work. So at the very time when America is bearing down on transgender bodies and voices and creative expression and rights, I want to give my community a supportive space to dream, and I want to ask us and tell each other what is possible. Can you go back a slide, please? So over the next three years, I'm going to create a new show by traveling across the U.S. and hosting Dream Labs, which are creative spaces where we support each other to dance and sing and write and tell each other what we dream of and imagine and most want because this is a terrifying time for my people to think expansively, and this is an important time for my communities to think expansively. So I'm inviting you all to join me in this work. I'm looking for NDP and NPN commissioners, presenters, funders, residency partners. Please come talk to me or find me at my website, shondorseydance.com. Thank you so much for listening, thank you. You're doing so well, audience. Take a deep breath. Exhale the stale air. Thank you, Sean. Next up is Lori Hepner. Thank you. Hey, everybody. So thank you very much for being here this morning. I know it's really early for a conference like this. Um, I'm just going to ask the AV people if you could start my video. That would be great. So I'm Lori Hepner. I'm a visual artist, and I draw with light, which has also turned into drawing with my body, which you will see soon. Um, the work that I've been making has come over the course of having a bunch of residencies where I was able to go to Arctic landscapes in Finland and Norway and Iceland to be able to sort of transverse the landscape but with other artists. So residencies where you're sort of stuck in the middle of a beautiful but also kind of insane nature with only other artists to deal with. And the experiences were some of the most amazing that I've ever had and has made me want to kind of go back to these places and to be thinking about them. So the work that you're seeing behind me is a series that's called Crowdsourced Landscapes. 
And I did this by going to Finland and talking with people to talk about how they thought their landscapes would be changing over the course of their lives due to climate change. And so they would either tweet back, Facebook message back, tell me in real life what they thought. And that became the titles of the pieces that you're seeing behind me. And you probably are wondering, like, how are these made? So this is a landscape photograph, obviously. And what I would do would put these landscapes, like you just saw, onto a six foot tall LED stick that plays back. So for me to create these, they're all long exposures of me dancing in my studio. And it's through that movement that it transforms the landscape. So while I'm doing this, I'm thinking about how I was moving in the landscape and how that affected my memory of those particular places and the fact that they were under threat. So with this work, uh, everybody was always asking me, well, how do you do this? And so it ended up that I created a system of now wearable LEDs and have been using that in a real-time projection software to be able to do this in front of real live audiences. And so the next project you're gonna see is a video that's a collaboration with singer Kendra Ross. And we had a residency at Kelly Strayhorn at Alloy Studios and created some of the work that you're gonna see in a second. seeing here is a part of this project we call Intersectionology. And this was done at Durban City Hall in Durban, South Africa, where Kendra and I went in June to perform at the Isaiah Festival, which is the International Symposium of Electronic Arts. And by being able to sort of be in this particular space, it was sort of a exploration of how for next project, sorry. So <laughs> I'm gonna move on to the next piece. Um, moving on from intersectionology, this is a solo piece that I've been working with a community, and this is a project called Color Beach View, and this happened last month, and I did a series of three public workshops with the community in Beach View to make intergenerational art with the community. And so we did live light painting, and it resulted in a series of uh, outdoor public art that's on the facade of the building and a large piece that is on the side of one of the T cars in um, Beachview. So you potentially got to see this running around the city of Pittsburgh and I haven't seen it yet. But the public art was a result of those workshops and it will be on the front of the building for at least a year. And we're hoping that we can potentially find space to do this as a kind of finalized piece that will stay there more than a year. But the light painting is something that I've continued to work with. And if you'd like to see more or invite me somewhere to do some light painting, you can go to my website. Thank you. Continuing her campaign for public office, ladies, gentlemen, thems, and theys, Christina Wong. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I thought I'd do a recap of my year. The theme of my year has been Everybody Hates Me. Um, yay. Uh, so how do I go back? So I, um, 
Hmm. All right. Uh, so so the, I, I went to Nigeria this year at the U.S. consulate with my show, The Wong Street Journal. Um, I was on a show called The Other News, which is their version of The Daily Show. And uh, uh, the show, The Wong Street Journal, is about how I went to Uganda a few years ago to do research about microloans, and I ended up making a hit rap album with local rappers in northern Uganda. It's a long story. Um, uh, uh, this is my music video. Um, I think we, we skipped the slide. Now, out of context, can we turn the volume Christina. down? Because everyone's ears are going to bleed. It's early. So uh, this show is basically about... Um, I intentionally thought, okay, I'm going to look at microloans. I end up meeting these rappers on the street, making a hit rap album. And the show itself looks at uh, my proximity to white privilege as an Asian American in East Africa who made this hit rap. So this album, this plays in northern Uganda. These are videos that are playing in northern Uganda. Out of con I will say a lot of people are angry with me, both the left and right, because out of context, this just looks like a crazy woman who's you know, dropped into Africa and made this thing. But I swear, I was collaborating and thinking about these issues, which are explored in nuance in the show. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, a funny thing that happened in Nigeria is that a few days in, they were like, okay, so someone finally Googled you, and you have to be very careful because Rex Tillerson is coming to Nigeria in a few days, and but you end up getting fired on the way back. And um, and and uh, if you say anything bad about Trump, one of us can get fired. So uh, so I had to like totally tiptoe around stuff, which is fucked up. But anyway, um, th so 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 I've been thinking um, the the way I would articulate it when I did media interviews in Nigeria rather than rail against the situation, as I said, it used to be that we listened to politicians and laughed at comedians. Now we listen to comedians and laugh at politicians. And that's sort of the impetus for running for office right now. So I've been doing, Christina Wong runs for uh, for public office. This is me debating a dog. So I'm doing all the things that we do. I won both debates, by the way, with a dog. Very service dog, too. And, um, and, and basically, I'm looking at creating a campaign. I've workshopped half an hour in progress with a COLA grant from the city of LA uh, that looks like a campaign. I've been, I've been fascinated with the theatrics, uh, the shitty theatrics of debates and campaigns. And, and I feel like as a performance artist that politicians have basically put me out of work. So, um, so I'm using this format of a campaign. I've sewn my, all, I sew all my sets. That's all felt that I've sewn. I come out in an Elvis cape and sing songs. And um, that's me being Kellyanne Conway on a couch, texting. Uh, but but I am actually really running for office. Uh, right now I'm running for assembly delegate uh, uh, in 53 where I live. Still learning what that is. It's a volunteer position. The election is coming soon. I, I'll figure it out. Okay, so something unrelated to the election is I, I uh, the Dream Resource Center um, that does a, uh, is a resource center for undocumented immigrants asked me to do a theater project, and I'm very proud of this eight-week project that I did with the undocumented community. And uh, we, we uh, did both learning about what your rights are, but also creating skits about that. Um, very proud of that. I put out a web series called Radical Cram School. I don't know if that will play which uh, is teaching so social justice to uh, a troop of Asian American kids. And um, uh, I don't know how deep we can go in, but basically the fast story is it got picked up by InfoWars. Um, they're, they're, they're the ones who got banned uh, uh, by uh, Twitter and Facebook for hate speech. And they said it was the most racist thing they ever seen because they've never seen their own shows. And... Uh, and that was really scary. That's what prompted all these death threats and rape threats from their very, very scary followers. And uh, now I'm going to skip ahead to this other project and then go back to that. Um, so I've been at the San Diego airport. Is this a video? It's not a video? Maybe it's not. Okay. Oh, yes. So this is um, uh, a project I'm doing with Samuel Valdez and DJ Cut and Candy at the airport. We're building a temporary waiting room so people can wait in this waiting room. Uh, we wanted to abolish ice from inside the airport, and that didn't really happen. It ended up being this. And uh, we have people write what they're waiting for. And, uh, okay, we'll go speed through. So I have a campaign office in Chinatown that just got taken down, not because I did something wrong. It just was only up temporarily. And I'm running for office. Yay, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking for commissioners. To, uh, to make this show thing a thing. Uh, you know, we, we always ask for stuff, that, that stuff.
One more round of applause for Christina Wong. Next up, it's a pleasure to welcome to the stage Trevor C. Miles. Trevor, come on up. There you are. Look and fly. Can we please start the video, NPM? Thank you, my goodness. Well, we may need it a little louder. We want to wake everybody up. Thank you. Thank 
you everybody for checking out my video, my goodness. I have literally about 30 seconds to throw everything at you, but I did that on purpose. 10 years, uh, born and raised from Pittsburgh, but 10 years I've been teaching hundreds of students across the city. I am the powerhouse performer that you want to work with. So if you have an interest in dance, music, video production, any type of engineering, if you like poetry, any type of storytelling, so, I have all the resumes, all the business cards, all the everything. You need to come and talk to me and see how we can do some cool things. I love my city, Pittsburgh, but it is time to relocate. It's time for adventure, and I'm looking for new opportunities. And let's have some fun. Can we have some fun? Thank you, NPN. Mwah. Excellent. If you are joining us late, Aisha Bell already presented. You can find her contact information in here. She had to fly away to New York City. Next up, it is a pleasure to welcome another Pittsburgh resident. Come on up, Nick Daniel. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Can we start the video? I'm actually really not going to talk a whole bunch. I'm not a big talker, believe it or not. But I am going to say my name is Nick Daniels. My company is the Dana Movement Ensemble. Uh, it stands for Dancers Against Normal Actions. And I am a gay black man who identifies as transgender. And you'll notice I'm kind of old. I'm 50 years old. I took a two-year break. Watch the video. the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation.
in within music and other things like that. And that's part of my creative process. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stanley, for um, presenting this Art Slam. And I am looking for presenters and commissions as well. Thank you. Take care. It's so wonderful to get to know what's going on here in Pittsburgh. This is only my second time here, so it's really meaningful to learn about the community here. Thank you. Next up, Jasmine. Davis. Hey, Sean, I love being trans as well. <laughs> Good morning. I'm really enjoying this experience here. Thank you for having me. I am going to first um, let you know about this piece uh, before the video run. I'll let you know when to run it. Um, Postcards from Over the Edge is directed by um, Rashawn May, an ally of ours, and also Tila Love, who's a black trans woman. Um, and also, it is written, it was written by Carol, Carol Bookbinder, Valentine Pierce, both allies, Jasmine Davis and Tila Love. Uh, we are trans women of color as well. And you can go ahead and run the video, and I'll explain to you. Utilizing a diverse cast from across the LGBTQ spectrum, racial and age spectrums, postcards links the present era of the story and the Storyville era of New Orleans with the universal mistreatment of sex workers, especially those who also belong to other marginalized groups, alternating monologues and dialogues across hundreds of years tell another story of a glamorized sex industry in New Orleans, a story that needs to be told. Though the Storyville era tends to evoke an image of luscious, lavish surroundings, to the basics, we only use one chair, one table, the stage is a room in the Newcomb Art Gallery that is currently occupied, well, was at the time, with an, ex, uh, with an exhibition called Empire. A show which seeks itself, which, which a show that seeks itself and, and interrogates the ways of histories that are told, remembered, and revised. What Postcards interrogates is the 1805 Crime Against Nature Law, which is called the Can Law, if you're not familiar with that, <clears throat> and its overall oppression of those in the sex work industry. Though the definition of, vi of violating can was nearly identical to prostitution, outlawing it, through oral and anal sex instead of vaginal sex. What a difference. <clears throat> the consequences were far more severe, though, including being labeled as a sex offender. In Louisiana, 40% of people lab are, uh, are labeled as sex offenders because of the CAN law. 76 of those were women, and 80% were black, damn near 95% were trans women of color. The cast underwrites the dark and boundless themes of social oppression with authentic relationships, adding an emotional punch to an unmeasurable problem that often just is easier to ignore. A furious mother concerned about her daughter 
a trans woman of color who refuses to comply with a bigot and plays the price. A tender way a madam protects her young protege. These stories are all what make the horrifying truths concrete. Thank you so much for hearing my piece, and I'm looking forward to doing more on this and bringing awareness to the crimes against nature law that people are still being affected by in New Orleans, Louisiana, well, Louisiana, period. So again, thank you so much. We're looking for presenters, funders. We're looking for, you know, anything that'll help. So holla at me, y'all. <laughs> Excellent NPN, you made it to halfway mark. You're doing so beautifully. Mr. Ratliff, I have only briefly met you, so if I say your first name incorrectly, please correct me when you come up here. Ladies and gentlemen, Rontherin Ratliff. Um, yeah, it is pronounced Rontherin. Um, so, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'm a sculptor. Um, <laughs> that's how I, I guess, identify. Um, but I like to think that what I do is, uh, I craft potential, you know? Um, I mean, I do it with material. I've done it uh, for years, working with uh, the youth arts program. Um, and so looking at the possibilities of, you know, what could be done, um, what could be done in the lives of young people, you know, um, what could be done with materials to say, whatever it is I'm trying to say. Um, and my introduction to, this contemporary art practice that I have sort of grew out of this idea of sharing and um, sharing, I guess, those things that we might feel is, or for me, I guess, was like a vulnerable moment. Um, and and how do we, how do I like work through that, and and how do I present that to an audience? Um, and it became like sort of a way to look at how to present questions um, that I didn't have the answer to. Um, and, and through the process, uh, maybe I found some of the answers, but um, after, you know, I mean, the work itself sort of exists as a question that sort of community around me can sort of help find a question to. And this one was about, you know, youth and gun violence um, and sort of what, who, or how we all were responsible, what roles we played, um, how we voted, you know, like where do we put our money in community? Like how does, you know, all these things sort of create that situation that like led to this object taking the life of someone. So um, yeah, that question was like, yeah, what, what can we do? And what are we not doing? Um, and so, um, this was just, you know, this idea of having fun as well. Like, I have, uh, I mean, I don't know, sandwiches are my favorite food. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's easy, simple. But, um, but yeah, I was kind of looking at, like, a way to sort of, I don't know, present the things that, uh, I was digesting, you know? Um, I mean, it was like, just, yeah, like political issues, issues of, you know, personal issues. Um, and so it was just, yeah, that became a way to sort of say what it was that I was kind of digesting um, at the time. Um, but a lot of the, the work I do, it, one of the things I'm interested in is architecture um, and the other is sort of human behavior. And, and so a lot of what I do is try to use 
found materials to sort of explore this sort of these ideas of human behavior, why, why we do what we do, um, what does it all mean, and sort of along the lines of human behavior, this piece was sort of looking at, it was titled Triggering Fear, uh, but it was looking at this idea of police violence and, um, and sort of where does that like stem from, but uh, this is another one, two, and so, and so yeah, this piece is sort of looking at uh, sort of the use of abandoned houses in New Orleans and how the potential of those houses could be used to support artists. Um, and so this whole Rosebud series was sort of all geared toward the potential, looking at the potential in architecture and how sort of access to those properties could lend support to artists to have a foundation to work, to create, um, and to sustain themselves. Thank you. Coming to us from the Bay Area of California, Marga Gomez. Good morning, NPN. A special uh, hola to uh, all our friends watching this on HowlRound right now in their hotel rooms having breakfast. <laughs> Thank you for recording this. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Marga, uh, or Marga. Uh, my pronouns are ho, hoes, and homes. <laughs> I'm a, mm, let me do, start this different. My New Year's resolution is to be an optimist because I've been a pessimist for two years. And um, I did not uh, think that we'd all be alive in 2019, so I didn't book it. This is my date book. <laughs> this is my date book. And uh, <clears throat> I'm, here, um, I'm here to ask you to help me fill it I, I, with performances or just go to your house. Just please, anything. Anything, I'm at bargain negotiation rates, and it's all good. I don't care. I don't care. I'll do whatever you want. Um, but um, right now, <clears throat> I'm offering to you uh, my latest, my 12th one person show called Latin Standards. And um, it, thank you. Um, it opened at, um, at the Under the Radar Festival in 2017, and I've been, uh, I've been playing it around the country. Uh, Borderlands Theater, I think. Uh, I think we had a good experience, so you can talk to Mark P. I'm very easy to work with, <laughs> as long as it's not in the morning. Uh, and um, and I, want to, I want to perform it more. I, I love it, and I think that it has, although it's a personal story, um, it also has, um, I think it's really relevant to now because it makes uh, the personal political, and it's about Latinos and, and queers, and it's a story of creative addiction uh, passed down from my Cuban father uh, to me, his lesbian daughter. And it's set in, in uh, our ramshackle house in Washington Heights in the 60s. And in one of the last Latino drag clubs in the world in San Francisco called Esta Noche. And, um, and also it takes place in this, what frames it and what the excerpt is, is um, this concert that's not a concert. And um, so, um, Nick, if we could just uh, roll that clip now. The first Latin standard I'm going to introduce to you tonight was never recorded. My father called it una mesa y dos sillas. In English, that's a table and two chairs. But don't think of it that way, because everything sounds better in Spanish. <laughs> una mesa. 
Yes. You know what? I forgot to tell you this. <laughs> uh, um, there is no orchestra coming to this concert. <laughs> there won't be any kind of instrumentation, not even a ukulele. It's not that kind of concert. This microphone is fake. <laughs> it's just a different kind of concert, and I'm not going to be singing any notes. <laughs> because anybody can do that. Mm -mm. You deserve more. <laughs> this is a concert for real music lovers <laughs> who never want the song introduction to end. <laughs> because you are passionately curious and invested in the backstory, the origin, the minutia, the fun facts of the song. This is for you fans of banter and patter and the NPR musicologist DJ whose introductions are longer than the song itself. Particularly this song that was scribbled on a guest check by my father during his restaurant years. I'm going to do it for you now in the original Spanish and then I will explain it to my English only friends. <laughs> Una mesa y dos sillas. So far? <laughs> <laughs> que sola se ven porque tú no estás ni yo también. Solo fue como un recuerdo de lo que fuimos, tú y yo, pero ya no somos. And then my father wrote, Budweiser, Coke, Shrimp, Chicken. <laughs> Not part of the song, but performers need to multitask. <laughs> English only friends, I'm with you, I'm with you now. Uh, we could turn that down a little bit because as you can see, I put words on it. Uh, I put my clip together at um, 11.58 p.m. and it got in on time, so I'm very excited about that. And um, as you can see, I have a variety of blazers and uh, I will wear whatever blazer you want. Um, that blazer was found uh, in a thrift store in San Francisco on the Burning Man rack. It was a jacket that burners didn't want, and I was able to buy that for a performance artist budget. Um, we could turn the volume down a little bit. Um, I also have uh, three more shows that are uh, ready um, to tour. This was directed by David Schweitzer. Um, I love this show a lot. Again, it, uh, it really says a lot about holding space in my father's day and in our time, holding space for artists and people of color. Um, it, can, it can go anywhere, it's adaptable, it can be grand and elaborate, or it can actually be, I can, I, can, I can perform this anywhere, I just need a good sound system. And I want to thank, I, I want to thank uh, NPN for having me back, and I want to thank uh, Pittsburgh for being such a beautiful and inspiring city. And uh, my only, uh, uh, oh, uh, and a question for Pittsburgh is, um, you need buttons in the elevators. You need, even if they don't work, I, I, I need to push something. I look stupid every time I go in the elevator, I reach for buttons that aren't there, and really we're capable of pressing the buttons. My website is margagomez.com. I printed up hundreds of cards uh, about the show, and if you take one from me, I'd feel uh, this is a success. Thank you very much. A quick announcement, if you are signed up for the Falling Waters Tour, please meet at registration table at 1045 to depart at 11. 1045 to depart at 11. Thank you, Marga. So, coming up next, Last Call presents Alleged Lesbian Activities. Come on up, please. Yes.
can't believe I'm going out as an elf. We were babies and scared shitless, but we would get all dressed up like we were going out on Saturday night and get in my car and go drive down. And of course, what we were seeing was this bar on the corner. We would just like drive by. We might park across the Legion Fields and just like practice being lesbians at a bar. You know, there weren't magazines, there weren't movies, there weren't shows. We This was our only visual experience of the divorcing. I think the narrative of where we've come from and you know what's happened to us and how we got to where we are it's, it's, it's important that we tell the story. the volume down now. <laughs> um, where's, the clicker? where's the clicker? Here? I think this is a clicker. Um, I'm Bonnie Gable. And my name is Indy Mitchell. And we are two of um, four current uh, core organizers of Last Call. Um, Last Call is a collective of artists, activists, and archivists collectively and creatively interpreting queer history um, in New Orleans and around the country. And I am gonna set the timer for a little bit less than a minute, because now I just talked. So, <laughs> or, oh, okay, great. Then I'm gonna set it for a minute. Um, and I'm gonna end a little early. All right, um, <laughs> so uh, we are currently touring our production, Alleged Lesbian Activities, that we've created over the past five years. And I was thinking this morning about what's really exciting to me still after five years of working on this project. And one is that the project has over 50 collaborators, and so the creation process for the project is a mirror of the um, kind of spaces that we're trying to call up in the world. It's, it's like branching and multimodal and intergenerational, um, and it's a place for us to be in space together as we're creating spaces for people to be in space together, and we're excited, or I'm really excited about on the tour, um, sparking other projects like this in other cities and working with local communities to give them a window into how we've been working so that maybe they can do this work um, where they are uh, and continue to lift up histories that have been hidden. What I'm excited about is um, being able to go into other and new communities and connect with um, more seasoned folks, because I think there's a lot to be learned, a lot to be shared, a lot to be uh, preserved. And what I find the value in this work has been for me is really this moment where I'm on stage playing Frankie, watching the um, seasoned interviewers or interviewees watching us um, interpret and like live or play their lives. And that is a magical, special thing that I think all dykes, all lesbians, all queer, all trans people, especially people of color and black people deserve to experience. Um, so yes, we are very excited to be here in this space. We're very excited um, for all of the support that we've already received. And we're very excited to continue connecting with folks all over this country um, and world um, around dyke bars and other things gay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and just we're around, get in touch with us. We have these really cute little books that talk about our work as well, these little zines. So um, yeah. And if you want to come see the show in April, on the first weekend in April in Boston, there's you can get NTP uh, NEPA subsidy to come see the show. Yeah, so what Bonnie said. Thank you. <laughs> Shh.
She said NIFA subsidy, yo. <laughs> Get yourself to Boston. Next up is Robin Anderson on behalf of Access Dance Company. Come on up, Robin. Hello, I'm Robin Anderson. Good morning, everyone. Um, can we start the video, please? I'm experimenting with a slideshow that's already timed. So, Access Dance Company is a 31-year-old physically integrated dance company based in Oakland, California. That is a mural right across from our building in the Malanga Center. Isn't it awesome? This is our new artistic director, Mark Brew, who was appointed to be artistic director in 2017 by our founder, Judith Smith. And it's a lot, these are some images of our company working in the studio this summer. I wanna share a quote, sorry, I keep going back and forth with this microphone, about critics' response after Mark's first season with Axis. Fearless and contemporary, inventive and reinvigorated Axis is still breaking artistic ground. This is a new project that we are going to be making in this upcoming year, and Mark's going to describe it. I'm very excited that my first international commission for the company is to invite UK dance theatre maker Arthur Pitta to make his first work with Axis. Arthur Pitta is Portuguese and studied dance in Johannesburg. He gained his master's degree from London Contemporary Dance School, and for the past 15 years, Arthur has run his own company, Bado Arthur Pitta. Arthur's gone on to create work for his own company and with major companies from around the world, such as Ballet Black, San Francisco Ballet, Paris Opera Ballet, and most recently, he's created a work called The Tenant with James Whiteside from American Ballet Theatre. Axis will produce its largest scale project to date with the commission of dance theatre artist Arthur Pitta. Creating a work around homelessness in the Bay Area through the lens of Alice in Wonderland, entitled Alice in Oakland. These are some images from a work that Arthur just created on San Francisco Ballet called the Bjork Ballet last year, just to give you some visual, more visual images of his work. Um, his work we're describing, it's sure to be a visual feast of dance theater interlaced with storytelling and striking imagery that will push and challenge our company to new territory. Alice in Oakland will premiere at Z Space Theater October 25th, 2019. And we are looking for commissioners, uh, Mid-Atlantic partners, um, and NDP partners. Um, I'm also going to show you a video of our work that we continue to tour, Radical Impact, which was Mark's first work that he created for the company as artistic director. This program has three pieces on the program, Reflective Surface by Amy Seiwert as well, and a third program as well.
continuing to book. Presenting Axis is a great opportunity to target new audiences. Performances and residencies come with an accessible guide that provide tools for cultivating partnerships with your communities, developing marketing materials that will reach new populations, and strategies for implementing accessibility services that allow you to serve a broader audience. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Last night, I got to hear Eddie's work at the open mic, and I'm so glad they're going to share more right now. Please welcome Eddie Maisonnet. Maisonnet, thank you. I am too short for the podium. It's OK. I heard like a oh. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Congrats for making it out of bed. Much love and respect to people who decide to sleep. Um, so I'll be just introducing some like basic concepts that um, I work with. So I'm a black, uh, non-binary, um, Afro-Puerto Rican um, boy. I'm based in Boston, born and raised. And um, I swear there are the black people there. I promise, yeah, there's like most of them here. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Um, going through this, I just want to note that um, my story is only mine. Um, uh, please avoid generalizing while there are people who can definitely find home in my narrative and find parts that resonate, um, which is one of the hugest honors that I can come up with. Um, I am only one. Um, so, and I also bring up my medical transition as a calculated disclosure, and I want to note that, that as a black, trans, and queer artist, that that is a creative disclosure that I'm doing um, on my own terms. Um, and just a quick heads up of just like um, something that has come up in my now like two, three year uh, experience of um, performing and being a teaching artist is like sometimes this, uh, uh, assumption of intimacy, often from cis folks. Um, so I just want to put that out there into the space. Um, do I have a? Is this the clicker? The like weird little thing right here. All right, cool. Awesome. So emerging through transition, embodying process, trial and error. Um, I am the my everything that I'm doing is the process of um, is a process of trial and error. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing, and I'm figuring it out. Um, so my residency project with Theater Offensive um, was called the QTPOC Boston, uh, the Boston QTPOC Mixtape Project. Um, I conducted a series of free workshops that were catered, um, geared towards QTPOC folks. I was wondering, like, where the hell is my fam at? Like, why, and when I'm walking around the city in queer spaces, am I only seeing transplants? Transplants. Um, why are we leaving? And then. Uh, there is the issue of gentrification that happens, um, and while there is the infrastructural effect that happens with gentrification, um, what I wanted to target was the cultural effect, uh, the amnesia that, that, the induced amnesia that comes as we destroy the physical reminders of memory um, and only strengthens like a rebranding of a city, which Boston is definitely in the midst of. Um, also, quick note, medical transition is not the crux of my identity. It is just what is observable. Um, so that's me in uh, October 2017. Um, after the workshops, I found storytellers to work with me, storytellers and um, a crew to work with me. Um, while I presented like a kind of hybrid workshop, hybrid uh, performance. Um, and this was one of my storytellers who is um, a black trans advocate. Um, Aaron is amazing, um, absolutely amazing. And then here is um, a black elder in the community who was one of the people who um, was a part of starting Boston's one and only black gay club um, right after he came from Vietnam. Um, and then we have Liz James who was in the audience um, and one of my friends. And I just wanna show like, I, this was such an awesome experience for me to have this enraptured audience and like this is an activity we were doing that Stokely was leading and did very well. Oh my God, so handsome. Um, <laughs> and um, this is a panel that we did a talk back, which was another uh, component I wanted to emphasize as we were talking about process. Wow. So that was one of the flyers. I am but a cherub in that picture. Um, 
And that has become kind of awkward because I would like to, um, I end up using pictures from old things. Um, and, um, but you know, then, it, then there is this process of like, I have to engage with the external, um, the external of it as people are beholding my body. Um, here's another panel I do. Uh, a flyer, I do panels sometimes. Um, I was able to open for Kit Yan when he came to Boston. That was dope as hell. And yeah, this is another flyer. And well, I was gonna show a video to show just like how tiny my voice was and just how aware of that I am. Um, but yeah, we can do like 10 seconds of it. There is a script, whether it's at the post office, the first day of school or an interview, it's an icebreaker for me and two truths and a lie. All right, we good. I have three middle names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was one of my very first performances. Um, and I was scared shitless as I'm still scared shitless now, but I know slightly more what I'm doing, right? Um, yeah, so I am a teaching artist primarily right now. And if you would like to bring me to your city, I'm very mobile. I am just one person and I just need a laptop and a mic or a room. Um, and I would like to continue to work on this mixtape project. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to NPN for the scholarship. Thank you to everyone who has presented and has made this a very home, uh, home and welcoming place for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, please welcome Andrija Mosley. Come on, oh, dancing down the aisle, dancing down the aisle. Wow, I'm still awake. How are you guys? MPN, thanks MPN, thanks MPN, thanks MPN. Um, my name is Andresia Mosley. I'm a poet and actress, uh, touring nationally uh, from Tampa, Florida, sunshiny Florida. And uh, yeah, there's a few Florida folks here. And I was just newly commissioned this year for a one woman show called Five Black Women, written and performed by me. Yeah. <clears throat> and the project is uh, commissioned by uh, Art to Action and ASU Gamage and it's in the process of script development. So where we are is this September, we actually held our first work in progress um, at ASU Care Cultural Center and actually got a live audience behind 22 pages of script that I've written all by myself. And uh, it was dope. So we're in the second part of the process in 2019, uh, finishing the script. I am looking for another potential uh, write-in residency with a work in progress for 2019. Uh, we do actually have one already booked in Florida. Uh, for 2019 at Stageworks Theater. And basically what the show is about is that we're all crazy, um, including black women, <laughs> uh, in, in the sense of identifying. So it, it deals with identity, sexuality, uh, religion. I always tell people it's somewhere between the church, the hood, the club, and the stage. Um, and if I had to say it character-wise, I mean, imagine like a Christian uh, minister, a school teacher, a strip club recruiter, <laughs> and uh, an androgynous, you know, womanizer, and if they were all a part of the same narrative. So, you know, nothing unusual. So what I've done uh, is I have um, composed, and I also want to shout out to that the project is being directed by the beautiful Andrea Saff, um, who's a good friend of mine, so we are collaborating and working together. But what I've done is I've put a video clip together of just some clips from uh, our work in progress that will give you kind of a slight introduction to the characters. I am looking for uh, touring sites starting in 2020. Um, I'm also looking for, you know, presenters. And as always, I will never deny your money. So if we would play the video, please. When I was my mind, God spoke to me. <laughs> and he told me, that basically what I need to do is not only do the pantomime, but I also need to praise him with my song. I'm sitting 
see in the party with a tight ass bra and some tight pants and shit. And I'm thinking, okay, so there's two chicks in here, like five dudes. And I'm like, why are we in the middle waiting for wolves and shit? And so this nigga come over to me and I'm like, you know, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? He's like, nigga, don't smoke them like that. I don't smoke, I'm taking a break. And I was like, fuck that nigga, pass me for one. So he come over trying to spit game or whatever. I don't know, man. I can't tell you what took over me, but I stacked my pants a little bit, rolled up my sleeves and shit. And I was like, nigga, I'm getting as fuck. Good morning, class. Have a seat. Everyone have a seat. Down. So Mr. Johnson has something he would like to show the class. Do you have something you would like to show the class? everyone come talk to me coming up next is the incredible Rosie Simas So that means, um, oh, how does it mean in this context? Thank you for being. Uh, my name is Rosie Simas. I am Haudenosaunee or Iroquois en Francais. I am Onondaga or Seneca in English. I am Heron Clan. I am the fifth great granddaughter of Chief's corn planter, Half Town, and Kinjakati. I am the great granddaughter of doctors Eliza Kinjakati Winnie and Elizabeth Winnie Waterman. My ancestors are Seneca, Oneida, Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, Tuscarora, Stockbridge Muncie, and the exterminated neutrals. I say all this because it is important to identify who I am in a longer way as days go by <laughs> so that people continue to understand that we are very complex in who we are. My youth was spent dancing around a drum and in play with other native bodies. Before I forget, you can just show these slides at random. They can go over and over and again. Therefore, the architecture of my body is formed by a deep connection to the earth, my culture, and the intertribal community of the Twin Cities where I grew up and currently live. 
The images I am sharing with you are from rehearsals from my next project, Weave. My work investigates how culture, history, and identity are stored in the body and expressed in movement. That movement takes many forms, from the movements that I find to create improvisational scores, which is the majority of my pieces, to the movement of me filming, making my film work, or the movement creating the sets. Weave is a dance project drawn from the interwoven and interdependent nature of our world. In Weave, individual and embodied stories are the vibrant threads that mesh in a performance woven of story, dance, moving image, and quadraphonic sound. Weave brings together an international gathering of native, feminist, queer, transgender, and people of color working together on my vision, I am very lucky, to create this work through a native feminist lens. They are composer Francois Rochon from Montpellier, performer Zoe Klein, San Francisco, Sam Mitchell, San Diego, George Stamos, Montreal, Leslie Parker, St. Paul, Val Valerie Olivero, Minneapolis. In each community, we work with five community performers. In addition, we have a community engagement organizer and writer who works with us with each community, Ahimsa Bodaran, and poet and uh, native writer organizer, Hyde E. Erdrich. The community engagement work we do is created specifically for each city, town, venue we partner with. These titles may sound boring, but I can guarantee you they are not. We do workshops, panels, classes, and have open rehearsals. In Minnesota, for instance, one of the things we are doing is working with native writers, local native writers, who we pay to come to open rehearsal or to workshops and then have them write in whichever way they want to reflect on the work. We share those in our blog, which you can see on our website, Rosie Seamus Weave. One of the writers wrote, Rosie Seamus understands water. She understands the human is water, that water is human, that understanding becomes movement in weave. That's Ojibwe writer Marcy Rendon. Weave is iterative, iterative. The first iteration is presented by the Ordway and O'Shaughnessy. Where's my time? I don't know who I'm supposed to be looking at. Oh, oh, I'm almost done. Oh my gosh. Okay, uh, in uh, on January 12th, 2019, the performance is ASL interpreted and audio described. A teacher's guide and experiences for educators happen prior to the school show at which a thousand youth will attend. Anyway, we have really generous commissioners and funders, and we have some tour subsidy left from NIFA and DP for one partner who really wants to engage with us and wants to authentically engage with us with their community. Thank you. I also have these little cards you can please take from me. Yahweh Skano, thank you, Rosie. Next up, Samora Pinder Hughes. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so honored and happy to be here. Um, I'm just gonna present one thing that I created. It's a solo piece called For Those Lost. Um, which it was uh, dedicated and inspired by the murder of Sandra Bland. Um, and it's uh, going to be shown in concert in collaboration with a, a, pro a project by uh, data artist Josh Bagley, who I work with often, called Officer Involved.
Promise me I'll be alive when I leave my home. Promise me I'll be alive when I try. Stoplights could be murder. Movements could be murder. Conversations be murder. Oh, promise me I'll be alive when I leave my home. Promise me I'll be alive when I drive alone. Stoplights could be murder. Movements could be murder. Steel bars and they put a charge on my name. Now I think they got me back in chains. If I die before you wait, I need you to know that I was looking forward to my new job tomorrow. But these lights my life may take when I'm on the road back. I can't stand the sirens. I hear them and I know what follows. I told myself I won't break. They shouted a warning. They made up a story. They said I resisted and I might go missing. All my mama does is pray. She'll wake in the morning and not be in mourning. That's why I just need you to listen. Promise me I'll be alive when I leave my home. Promise me I'll be alive when I try. Stoplights could be murder. Movements could be murder. Conversations be murder. Oh, promise me I'll be alive when I leave my home. Promise me I'll be alive when I drive. Stoplights could be murder. Movements could be murder. Conversations lead to confrontations. Can't take it no further. Thank you for shining a light on that. It's difficult to come back and stand at a mic and do an announcement, so thank you. Um, if you are going on the Falling Waters tour, you need to go out those doors now and prepare to do that. But please stay, if you can, for Yara Treviso. And please correct my pronunciation. Hello. Buenos dias, hola, como están? I'm just seeing if it's bilingual. Hold on a second. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Hi, good morning. I think I'm the last one. Yay! Okay, I'm just gonna shake it off a little bit. I've been sitting for a while. <sighs> okay, thank you so much for being here early in the morning. Uh, my name is Yara Travieso. Yara, like yada, yada, yada. It's easier to remember that way. Also, it's a small town in Cuba where my family's from. And uh, I am a director. I am a choreographer, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a writer, and I am interested in the stories that my mom and my abuela told me about who I was as a woman, and I had to unlearn all those stories in school. And so I uh, understood storytelling through myth, mythology, uh, all the, the sort of literature that we read in school, and I understood my place inside those stories. So 
I am interested in creating new myths for women. Uh, I'm interested in uh, encompassing space, both on large scale, but also encompassing many spaces. I work in the film world, I work in dance and theater, and I'm interested in the women that, in the stories of the women that I tell, encompassing many, many spaces, not just one community, but many. Uh, can we go, I think I'm gonna skip through a few slides. Can we go, next one, next one, next one. Yeah. Okay, no, before. Uh -huh. Okay, so before I play this video, this was a large. Uh, can you hold it? Hold, hold. Thank you. Um, so this is a work, uh, one of the first large-scale works I created. It's more uh, performance, dance-based work, and it was just uh, done at the Park Avenue Armory. Okay, go. So that was a 2014 project and it was a love story. Uh, it's sort of a, an understanding of intimacy between woman and emptiness. And uh, the next work I wanna talk about, you can go to the next slide. This is uh, the work that I've been touring recently. It premiered in 2017. It's called La Medea. Uh, the work takes on the, originally I was interested in, in adapting the Greek myth by Euripides Medea. And as I dove into the work, I realized that I could not adapt this work because it was not made for this woman to be free. And so what I decided to do was to reject the entire myth and dismantle it and explode it from the inside out. So what it is, it turned into a Latin disco pop variety show. It's a live film. So as the audience, you enter a big modular space and you are not an audience. You become the Greek chorus and the film extras for a film we're creating live. And you participate in collaborating with us to create the images and the world and the language of the cinematic Medea that we've made. However, the world exists in multiple spaces, so it's it's a film that we create in real time. It's live streamed, so audiences are watching the film being made at home through a very curated lens. But then audiences in the theater, the Greek chorus, is experiencing a live filmmaking experience where they see the behind the scenes and the more real dismantled narrative of the fiction. So what you get is a multiplicity of this woman. She is multiplied in many screens, in many spaces, but there's mirrors everywhere. And also every character in the story becomes Medea. So what I'm trying to make with this work is a more infinite, a more multiplied, a more complex, and a more unresolved woman in history. Can we play the trailer? Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Audiencia Nocturna, live in our studio, we bring you the mother, the warrior, the foreigner, the So you could live love I left my family So you could live love I'm gonna do this deed And when the deed is done You'll be a widower and child I would rather die 
limit time. This work is touring right now. It exists in many forms, both, both proscenium and live. And I also have more proscenium stage work that uh, I'm creating right now. Um, but we're looking for more spaces to tour La Medea. Thank you so much. We're done. One more round of applause for all of the incredible artists we got to learn about. <laughs> Sit tight. We have one more thing to share with you. When we slam, then we burst. And I'm going to introduce Stanlin Brevet to introduce our art, Burst. You can use this. Use this. Thank you. And thank you to Christopher Morgan for emceeing. That was amazing and very inspiring. Thanks to all of the artists. Real quick, before I introduce this next amazing art burst, I just want to let you all know that we do have a new Platicas conversation that is going to be happening at 1 p.m. in Westmore East. And that is entitled The Role of Political Analysis and Cultural Work. And Sage is hosting this conversation. Um, 1 p.m. Again, if you want information, um, you could check the Platicas board. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our next artist, a longtime friend of NPN, Michael Sakamoto. Michael Sakamoto is an interdisciplinary artist, educator, scholar, and arts manager, creating choreographic and narrative performances, media works, and photo essays designed to provoke intercultural dialogue and reveal diverse experiences across geography, language, and social boundaries. His works have been presented in theaters, galleries, and alternative sites in 14 countries worldwide. Recent works include Flash, a Bhutto hip-hop duet with acclaimed choreographer Rennie Harris, Soil, a dance theater trio with traditional and contemporary performers from Cambodia, Vietnam and Thailand, and Monk, a photo essay project performing Japanese American identity through Bhutto body and images in Cali, Hawaii, Japan, and France. Michael has been presented by NPM partners Kelly Strayhor Strayhorn, woo -woo, Maui Arts and Cultural Center, Intermedia Arts, Painted Bride Art Center, Lynx Hall, Mecca, and Highways. Michael will be performing today an excerpt from his new solo work, Blind Spot, an intermedia collaboration with digital composer Christopher Jette. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Exploring mediated identity, corporate militarism, and intercultural politics. Michael, please take the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If you cover one eye and you hold with your other arm your thumb all the way out, right in front, and with your open eye, fix on that point in space, and then slowly move your thumb to the side, still gazing at that point, and about right here, for me it's right here, your thumb should disappear. This phenomenon, in medical terms, is called punctum sacum, a hidden point or puncture. The Greeks called it scotoma, darkness, but in everyday language, we just call it a blind spot. As you just saw, we all have it, but most of the time we don't notice because our brain learns over time to steal the surrounding information and mask it. So from the first moment in life we open our eyes, there's always something that we just don't notice. And if you add up all those moments, that's a lot, inside and all around us that we just never see. For example, there's a photo I always think about, the day my parents brought me home and became my parents. That photo's not me anymore, right? I'm, uh, I, I mean, it's just a, a, a photo of me. It's, okay, you know what it is? It's the light bouncing off of my former body, um, shooting into a glass prism, the inverse image being thrown into a dark chamber, burning into silver halides on acetate, um, the dark chamber only open for a second, um, a device that we all not only know and love, but own, we carry in our pockets, uh, otherwise known as a camera. All right, sorry. My inner science geek pops out like that sometimes because I just love cameras. I've collected dozens and dozens of them from all over the planet for decades. But even after all that time, I can't actually tell you what this 
camera, this chamber, this enclosed netherworld actually is. I mean, this photo, for example, right? That's, that, that's not me anymore. I, I, I'm not there. I'm here with you. That's not right either, actually. OK, so I want to be here with you. But all this and all this always somehow gets in the way of all this. This this that you see before you now, but which I can't because I'm here, not there, where you are, where I can be seen. I can never see myself. I can just be myself. Yes, give it up for Michael Sakamoto. So listen, if you're going to the Falling Water Tour, you're about to get left behind. You need to get out there. And if you signed up and you're not going on that tour, please let someone know at the registration desk, like ASAP. Um, next up, we have a five-minute bio break, so please take care of yourself. And then be sure to come back for the closing session. We have more art talks, art bursts, a native reflection, and closing remarks. So five minutes, grab some coffee, water, rehydrate, and get back here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>